so I'm well aware that there's quite a few of you watching this video already who just know that Brian doesn't have the self-control not to do an annoying intro in which he redoes the intro multiple times to symbolize the whole you died and you go back in and you died and you go back in and you died and you died and you died aspect of this game that we're talking about. But I'm going to manage it. Even though currently, as I'm saying this, I'm still thinking of how I could pull it off, but I'm not going to do it because that's right. Today, we're talking real talk here, Dark Souls. Look at this hand reference size, wide box, big game. This is that Star Wars Rebellion sized box, Dark Souls, the board game. Focusing heavily on one and three. If you've played these games, you know kind of what to expect from this. It is a very faithful translation of the games into board game. Now that might just raise your hackles a little bit. You'd be like, I couldn't even do the squeal that time, sorry. It might raise your hackles. There are some of you who might go, that sounds incredible. Let's find out, is it incredible? Or is it something you go, uh, maybe we should just play Descent instead. Let's find out. See, I told you, I didn't do it. I managed to get all the way through this without doing it. So, I really wanted to though. Let's find out. Before we go too much farther though, I just wanted you to know I'm going to do like a bit of an unboxing real fast and then jump cut it to already set up because I want you to see something that I really appreciate about this and that's this. First of all, the very first thing you see is you died. How great, right? Um, but no, this, this right here. So yes, I had to do all the, um, this kind of stuff and the cards come in their own little tray, but look at this. They come in their own little trays. Yes, they're messy right now, but they are trays for your cards. And then this, this is what I wanted to show you was these nice miniature containers, uh, kind of cool mini or not style with that cardboard. I like that. So let's see what it looks like kind of all set up. So before we go any further though, let's talk miniature quality. Look at the detail here. This is the Titanite Demon. Got a lot of quality here on the miniatures themselves. I'm just going to kind of slide and get a nice couple shots of the different ones, either the Gargoyle or the Boreal Dancer. I'm not really sure which one is which. Those Souls fans will know these though because they're straight out of the games. Interesting thing you see at the bottom, I think this is the dancer boss here, the main boss, not the mini boss, uh, and that does make a difference. One thing you'll see at the bottom of each base is this crosshatch. No, that is not mold lines, or those are not mold lines. Those are very important things, and I'll explain those when it comes to boss fights in a minute. Yes, that's right, boss fights. Look at this guy. He's straight out of uh, Mad Max. And then this guy is not a boss, but more of a higher level normal enemy tier. Let's look at the little fellows here and see kind of what that looks like in the game. You've got several different types of bad guys here. They all do different things. You'll notice the one here in the middle, the brown one, that's clearly a hero. But I just wanted you to see the amount of detail even on the heroes, pretty great. Then you got these for regular enemies, look pretty awesome, good quality sculpts. And then that's it. Also, one last before we go any further, before we go any further, I have not played the Souls games, but I have played a whole lot of Bloodborne. I've played a little bit of Dark Souls too, but a whole lot of Bloodborne. The games have a very specific style, and that is the main question. Does that style translate into a board game at all? So your player boards, very nice, thick, quality player boards. Four different types. You've got the Knight, the Assassin, the Herald, and the one I played as and really loved, the warrior. And then you have these cubes up here. These represent coal and saffron and sheep. No, that's not true. That's not at all true. Each person gets one of these to go in their base tier stats. The white markers mark their stats. You say, well, what are stats? We'll talk about that in just a minute because it plays a lot like Bloodborne and Dark Souls, the games in those. These red cubes represent damage to your health. The black cubes represent stamina. So if you have a certain card, and I'll show you what they do in a minute, uh, some of the cards that do, you know, different, your, your attack cards, for instance, they may take stamina. Well, anytime this bar fills up, stamina goes to the left, damage goes to the right. Anytime it fills up, you die. When one person dies, the entire party starts the whole run back over, and they lose a spark. Those words mean nothing to you yet, but I'm gonna explain what all that means in a minute. Weapon slots here, you've got a left hand, right hand, armor, and then an extra slot. These are all upgrade spaces. Your stuff can be upgraded if it has an upgraded slot. Here's what a character decked out would look like, and I'll explain 
what these have to do with it right now. So now we have some items as well as some stat boosts. Here's why that matters. So in the item cards here, I'll show you one of these close up up here. The item cards have certain things about them. For instance, this symbol in the top right means that only the knight can use that to start with. Um, this, this means single hand, DS means dark souls. Bottom right is how many upgrades it can be upgraded. This is the uh, dodge value it gives you the magic defense value it gives you, and the regular defense value it gives you. These are the requirements for strength, intelligence, dexterity, and faith. You'll notice they're all zeros. This is a beginner weapon. Like I said, the rest of them will have just a normal symbol in the top right like this, even though that one can only be equipped by the knife. What a horrible choice to pick right here. There's a better example. This pierce shield can be equipped by anyone, so it's got just that symbol. And notice the stats over there. You have to have 16 strength to do it. So on the warrior over here, we've got soul arrow in the extra slot, so in case you ever want to switch, one of your actions on your turn can be to switch, you know, these two things or whatever. But let's look at what he's got right here. You have to have an 18 strength to have that, boom, we've got it, zero, zero on those, and then a 31, excuse me, this would have to be all the way up here, a 31 on faith to use the halberd. I guess that's a type of weapon of the herald is why, and that's a faith character. So once you're here, all of these weapons and armor could be used. So the worker armor, 12, 12, 12, 12, gives you a single black dice to regular defense, a single black dice to magic defense. So on your turn, if you were defending against an attack, you would roll the combined value of a blue dice and a black dice if it's a regular attack. If it's a dodge, if you're trying to dodge, you would roll one single dice. So you get to use the amount of dice based on what you have. Black dice are basically standard. They go from ones to twos with one blank side. Blue dice are a little more advanced, twos to threes, and also one with no blank side, so you're guaranteed to hit. Orange dice, the minimum on them is still one, but it's one, two, two, three, three, four. A lot of damage from orange dice. If you get an attack that lets you roll multiple orange dice, which I had with the Herald in the game the other night, it gets pretty awesome. So that's the point of the different dice. The different colors are different things. So this halberd, for instance, you would roll uh, for one stamina, here's the stamina cost, one stamina you would roll one blue dice and get an automatic uh, result with that symbol on it, which also means, here's a handy thing, on the back of the rule book, every symbol in the game is shown. So that symbol right there means that it's the shaft, it can't attack at range zero, so you have to be one away because it's a long spear. So that's what that symbol means. For four uh, stamina, you can roll two blue dice and automatically get a one success. That's a really great weapon. So that's kind of the dice, the weapons, the, all this stuff. This is for magic damage is what that little circle means. So two black dice, you do magic damage, and that matters for the defense of enemies. Let's look at some enemy cards right now. I'll show you how the map is laid out in just a moment, but here are the different types of encounter cards. These are level threes, level twos, two bolts, look at that, and level ones over here. Um, these are the different types of encounters that you will face when it comes to running through the mission. Now what that looks like, so a level one, for instance, you will have these Hollow Knight, a Hollow um, Archer, I think that's what they're called, on Space 1, and on Space 2 you'll have the same thing, and there'll be a treasure on this space. I'll explain what that means in a minute. I just wanted you to see how the enemies are not randomly placed in a sense, like each card is a type of thing. So they get harder as they go up in number. So an enemy's card, though, there are one, two, three, four, five, six types of enemies in the base set. I'm gonna lay them out here where you can see them, and we'll talk about kind of what this means as we go along here. Health is in the top right. This is their threat value, or uh, I don't know if they call it threat or taunt value. Either way, the highest goes first. So this guy's always gonna go last here, the crossbow hollow. As you see, though, their health up here, type of character they are, this is their dodge value. So you would have to roll that for the dodge. Dodge dice I didn't talk about, they're 50-50. It's three dodge symbols, three blank symbols. Boom, we succeeded on this guy. So if you have somebody who can roll three dodge dice, a lot of times it's better to dodge, except it's all or none. If you dodge and you fail, you get the full blunt of an attack. How much damage do they do? This symbol right here shows how much damage they do. So four, five, um, four, three magic damage which is weird, I guess that's kind of more, it's magic, but it's really ranged as well, but either way, then six, and then none. Say so none, how do they do damage? I'll show you in a minute, because these guys are a pain in the butt. So the way this works is, their regular defense is here on the left, magic defense is there on the right. So earlier, when I was talking about shooting this soul arrow, 
if you're rolling magic defense, magic attack against this guy here, they're not going to block it at all. So all you would need is one success, and you got them. They're dead because they only have one health. Now, it's program movement for the enemies, kind of, and I love it. The enemies are going to do the exact same thing every time. The different symbols do different things, and I'll show you what that is right now. For instance, Silver Knight, Great Bowman here. He will move after, I'm sorry, he will attack first. So he's going to shoot the person with the aggro token. The aggro token is the person who activated last. So they're going to shoot the aggro person for four. If you want to block it, you'll roll your dodge or your block amount. So on this guy, it's the blue dice and the black dice. You would then soak only one just then. Let's get a better roll. So now you're soaking three damage. You're only going to take one. They also hit every single person in that person's circle or square or node, they call them. They would then move one space backwards away from the person with the aggro token. Kind of look at one more of those, you'll get a picture of how they work. So the Silver Knight Swordsman, he will move two spaces towards the nearest character. The good thing about this game is strategy is in moving the enemies because you decide if there's a tie, you can decide which character they go to. Now tie breaks towards the aggro person, but let's say the aggro person is the furthest away when it comes to attacking and moving. You then get to decide where they move when it comes to that. So you'll move towards the nearest person, yes, but if you have two people who are equidistant and you need them to attack the knight instead of the, uh, I don't know, the uh, herald, you can. Over here, they move towards two towards the nearest person, and then over here, they're going to move, they're, when they attack, they're going to do five damage to the nearest character, and then they're going to do pushing damage, not pushing damage, so they're going to push right here. That means you move out of that square. So you also get to pick which square you move to. Then they hit every single person in that square as well. And you can kind of see the rest of those. There's no different symbols on here. They're all pretty much the same thing. This guy is annoying because he only pushes. So when he moves into a square, he does five damage worth of a push. So you kind of just have to watch out. They're slow and lumbering and knock you around a little bit, but they can hurt still. So that's how the enemies work. Yep, another table pop up, but here's the deal. This is how the board is laid out. No, it's not laid out with two and you explore. I just don't have room for all of them because they're very large boards and you lay out the bonfire tile and four other boards as well as a mini boss tile at the end. And it gets pretty big. So it's six tiles. I think it's six tiles. Anyway, I think it's six tiles big or five tiles big. Either way, it's a lot. It's six tiles. It ends up being six tiles, which is a lot of board space. I know that took me a long time to say that, but it's a lot of board space. It takes a lot of tables. So just know that going in. So I'm only going to lay out two right now because that's all that matters. And when I do the mini boss, I'll show you what that looks like. So party starts here. They have a spark dial. Also really cool. A lot of dials in this game that have that whole Fantasy Flight X-Wing feel. Spark dial is right here. What it does is it signifies how many times you can start back and rest at the bonfire. Resting at the bonfire resets everything except, ironically, treasure. This sits right here. Look at that. Doesn't it look cool? It sits right there. When you do this, when you rest at the bonfire, you'll drop your spark down one number, and these don't reset in the sense you don't shuffle them back up, but you can come back in here and fight these guys again. Why would you do that? Because that's how you get experience, that's how you get better weapons, that's how you get stronger weapons that get you better at the game. Which is how Dark Souls works, is how Bloodborne works, it's how all of these Souls games work. And I'm so glad they translated it perfectly into this game. The only thing they didn't translate perfectly is the fact that it's limited. It is a board game though, so you're going to have to lose at some point or win. So the spark number is, that's what that is. So in a four person game, spark number is two. That's how many times you can rest at the bonfire. When you defeat a mini boss, you get one rest for free, which is kind of nice. Now, also you can upgrade your armor, weapons and everything here, and you can buy new treasure here. Your treasure deck would go here and your, new, and your inventory would go here. So, for one soul, you can flip a new treasure, see what it is, if you can buy it, and you can, I mean, if you can use it and equip it immediately, go ahead. If not, it goes into the inventory right here. Then, when you're ready, you come over and you kick this door in. No, it's not like Munchkin, you just kick in the door and you go into the next spot. There's a node limit though, so three people can never be, more than three people can never be on one node. So these are the spaces, these nodes here. So it's a little bit more free flowing, there's not like squares or anything like that. Then you flip the encounter card. This is a basic encounter card. It's level two. You have two of these hollow fellows with the ax that I showed you earlier. And here's what they'll do. You'll see the number one goes here. He goes on the number one. And this one goes on number two. This is a treasure icon. It goes right here in this map and this encounter. And this is a barrel icon. It goes here in this encounter. Barrels block movement. They can be destroyed and opened up. Uh, treasure also blocks movement, but at the end you get to pull two treasure cards once you 
open it. Now, you move into the room, okay? And let's just say this is what you decide to do. Well, here's the problem. If you'll remember, these enemies' cards will push you every time you move. Let's just get their enemy card over here so we can see that again. If you're in their spare, square, the large hollow soldier, they move one space towards the nearest player and they push for five damage. So the way this works is they will move one space forward. Well, you're guaranteed a free turn like that, except this chap right here, because he's going to move into one of these squares, push all five of the four, three of these people out for five damage. They'll have to either dodge or roll their defense dice. It's a one dodge, it's not a bad. Uh, roll for that. And you say, well, when do we get to go? Well, here's how it works because it's hard and Dark Souls the game is notoriously hard. The all of the enemies go, then one of your characters activates. Then all of the enemies go, then the next character activates. Then all of your enemies go, and the next character activates. And then you die, and that's how it works. No, this room is not too bad, but here's why I love this game. It's a puzzle. Each game is not a, it's not a fighting game. It's a puzzle game. You're trying to figure out the best and most optimal way to move around this board while simultaneously when you get to move the enemies, doing it in such a way that it's not cheating, you're saying, okay, well, he moves towards the nearest player, so that's here, right? So then he gets pushed. Well, where's the best place for me to get pushed to? Because if I push here, and he has the aggro token, because it's broken by a tie, well, this guy's gonna come here as well. So he's gonna get hit two times in a row. So you say, well, I'm standing here. He moves towards this guy. Then it's gonna push. Well, let's push him over here, because now this guy cannot get to him. So then this guy will either move here or here. It's up to your choice. If he has the aggro token, it's definitely up to your choice at that point. Now, all of that's kind of confusing by just saying, you know, the aggro token, blah, 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 this and this. You just keep going, you fight until these guys are dead and wiped off the map. When they're dead, you gain eight souls. That goes over here, like we talked about. And you can spend those souls how you want, flip the treasure. It is permanently flipped. You never get to do that again, even if you've rested the bonfire. And that is how regular encounters work. You do this over and over. If you'd rest, you get, you know, to go back through these encounters and gain the souls. So it's four rooms, right? Times eight is 32 souls plus the mini boss room. We'll talk about what that does in just a minute. Bosses and mini bosses have these great health dials too, by the way. This is the Titanite Demon. This is who we're going to be facing. He starts with 22 health. Yes, I know that's a lot. So here's our mini boss fight set up. You enter the room, mini boss goes here on that skull, and this is the Titanite Demon. So he's an info card, which is right here. Tells you everything you need to know about the boss, just like this. So for instance, he's uh, 10 on his, you know, whatever that number was we called it. 22 health. This is a symbol that is FAQ'd. He is not a main boss. He's a mini boss, which doesn't have a crown on it. He has four cards in his behavior deck. This is amazing. Three regular defense, two magic defense, 10 on heat up. So what is a heat up? We'll talk about it in a minute. Titanite Construct. If a Titanite Demon suffers three or more damage from an attack roll, reduce the damage by one. So he has toughness in hero clicks effectively. Uh, this, by the way, you would pick at the beginning of the game to tell you which one you're gonna face here. This is how you know what encounters you put out. So it's one level one and three level twos. Dark Souls set, there's gonna be expansions. Now, let's go from here. These are the behavior cards right here. Notice this one has a symbol right here, the fire. That's part of the heat up mode, and we'll talk about that in a minute. These behavior cards will go in a deck of behavior cards. They do not shuffle. So, if you lay these out, and you shuffle them up the first time, and you start to flip them. So his turn, he'll do this. Instead of a set enemy movement and attack like the regular enemies, he will do these four behaviors in a row. So this is called Vicious Swing. It is a one range, one dodge. Here's what he'll do. He will first turn 180 degrees. He will then attack from the front arc, the right arc, and the back arc. Every single person in those squares, and he'll do five damage. So if you're in that arc one, one range away, so boom, 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 boom. And if you're in an arc that is shared by a line, it counts as being in both arcs. So that's what happens there. He will do that and attack here. That was a weird example considering he turned right around very first. So then a hero will activate, then it goes back to him. So let's say we turn it over now. Let's grab and smash. So he will move one space towards the I'm sorry, he moves nowhere. He doesn't move anywhere. This is a weird set in a row. Let's do a different one just in case I can show you. This now, he will move one space 
in the direction towards the nearest player. That's what that symbol means. He will then push anyone who's in that space. Out of his front arc here, he will do four damage. The rear arc is his weak arc now, which means if you attack in that arc, you will get a plus one black dice. And that's how this goes over and over and over until you hit 10 health on his dial, because that's his heat up number, at which point he will then heat up, as you see on there, or 12, when he hits 12, I'm sorry. It's when you do 10 damage to him and he hits 12, you see the heat up symbol, you'll add the heat up card now into the mix and continue fighting right here. So now not only do you have to learn the new sweeping strike heat up card, he is shuffling his behaviors. So what you've learned and now know is coming is no longer the case. It's an incredible mechanic. And so that's it in a nutshell. That's how the bosses work. The bosses themselves, the big bosses are bigger than that and they have more health and all that kind of stuff. But that's how it works in a nutshell. You continue fighting, you continue going through the behaviors of the enemies, the bosses, and you win actually is what happens. When you beat them, you get, I think it's two souls per character for what's left on the spark meter. Now we had zero left on the spark meter which was weird, so we got zero souls unless we played something wrong there. That's a rules question I probably should have looked up before this, but how do I feel about this game? I like it a lot. Uh, there are a lot of great dungeon crawls out there. We can probably all name them Descent, right? That's what's in your head first. It's excellent, but this Dark Souls is great for multiple reasons. It is the best boss fight experience in a board game, period. This arc system, you know, with the, the four different arcs and one becomes a weak arc, and the attacks actually being thematic to that is incredible. When he does a big sweeping attack with his right hand, his left side's open. I, I think it's really cool. It's not, just, it's not just abstract, it actually is thematic. So when he does this big sweep with his right hand, hits from the front, the right, and the back, well, he's weak on the left, and vice versa. When he shoots lightning, he's not weak anywhere because he's concentrating out the front. It's really cool the way this works. Uh, best boss fight system I've ever seen in a board game. I mean, hands down, it feels like the Dark Souls games because that's the best part of the games is the boss fights. And now, the rest of the game, does it add up to this boss fight moment? Yeah, it does. And here's why. When we first learned this, it took a while to learn it and kind of piece everything together and get it all straight in our minds. But, so when we rested the first time, we got better, right? The second time we rested and went back through this, we finished in a good seven, eight minutes. It was just boom, 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 because we know what the encounter is going to be. Those enemies are always going to be on those same spots. They're always going to do the exact same behaviors in this encounter. Now, obviously, in a new encounter with a new mini boss, you would shuffle the encounter cards and they would all be different. But for this time that we were specifically playing through, much like the Souls games in Bloodborne, you know where that enemy is going to be. He's going to pop out from this corner, right? So it's just like that. When I play Bloodborne, I was a horrible at first, but now I know exactly where everybody is in Yarnum, right? You know what's gonna happen, and that's what happens here, and I think it translates perfectly. So does it translate to the people who aren't Dark Souls fans? It does, if you know that it's a very puzzly dungeon crawl with incredible looking miniatures, by the way. The quality of these miniatures is great. Some people were complaining that it's soft plastic. I haven't found that yet. Uh, I don't know if I got a you know, different version or whatever, but uh, I highly doubt that. The plastic is not very soft, like people were saying. It's softer than like, like a zombie side maybe, but it's not really soft. It's, it's great quality plastic uh, miniatures and, and they look good. They're very well detailed. I mean, the bucklers and the shields all have detail on them. They will paint up really well. I say paint, will paint up because I'm going to paint these things. They look great. But should you get Dark Souls? Absolutely. If you like dungeon crawls, this is a great dungeon crawl to add to your collection. It's got a lot of unique elements. The leveling up of your character in a very quick time is great. I really think you should try Dark Souls. If you haven't played the video games, try those. They're really fun too. If you, they remind you of an old school NES Super Nintendo game, even though they're 3D, because they're so hard. And this really captures that beautiful puzzle of figuring out where the enemy is gonna be and piecing together what you can do to stop it. So play Dark Souls. It's a great game. It's by Steam Force Games. They've done an awesome job. And I hope, based on the fact that these say Dark Soul base symbol, they're gonna continue releasing expansions for this because I would love to see some Bloodborne characters. See, there's already a Bloodborne game, I know, and maybe they'll work out the license thing, I'm sure, but man, it'd be great. And also there's a campaign mode at the end where you play five, six different scenarios and basically play through Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 3. It's really great. So hopefully they'll do a Dark Souls 2 expansion as well. For more from the Brian Drake at The Latest Retro, check us out on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. This may be the last of the videos you see in this room because we are going to close on our house and we will be in it very soon. So we're thankful for that. So 
Check us out, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. We have an Instagram now. It's at Brian, uh, it's not Brian Drake Show, that's the other one. It's the latest retro. It's right down here. Make sure to follow us and we will see you in the future on here. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.